Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter-day Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and religion, where it meets at LGBTQ Avenue and LDS Street. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for giving us an hour of your time to better understand this intersection. And it is an, a pretty interesting intersection today. I'm pretty excited about this episode. Uh, if you can't tell, I've got Sabrina and uh, Carmina in the Latter-day Stu- uh, Latter Stories studio today. Su- super excited because this is a really unique story. So welcome, ladies, to the podcast. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Sabrina Christofferson. Uh, and Carmina Alagan, two very, very interesting stories that we're going to talk about. I, now, we've talked about doing individual stories, and we'll kind of see how this works, but today we're going to do the couple story because you two met as sister missionaries yeah. heading yeah. to California, and now you're holding hands together, and you're sitting in the Latter Gay Stories studio in the hot seat. We are. Crazy. It's crazy. It's like there's a story here to tell. I think so. No way. <laughs> so as you can tell, this is going to be a super fun, super interesting, and uh, super Mormon Latter-day Stories podcast episode. And I'm just excited for it. So again, thank you for those who are joining us on the audio and video uh, versions of this podcast. If you are listening on an audio version, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. And for those of you who are watching on a video version, use the chat. Uh, if you're on YouTube, the chat's on the right there. And share your comments as we go through the episode, because we would love to hear them. Love to kind of get some uh, listener and viewer feedback as we go through the latter Gay Stories podcast episode. Who do we start with first? Uh, and where does this story begin? Should we start with um, Carmina? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's just let I actually let's um, talk to both of you first. Let the audience get to know a little bit about about you, where you're at today, what you're doing in your life. And then we'll jump into the hard questions about who, what, why and where. OK, okay. sounds great. Sounds cool. Um, well, I'm Carmina. I'm from Maryland. I was born and raised there. Uh, my family's uh, were Filipina or Filipino. So. I grew up with the Filipino culture, but living in America. And I am currently going to school in uh, Logan at USU. I transferred there just this year um, from BYUI because it was a that's a that's a story. Um, and I'm studying to be a um, occupational therapist later on. I'm Sabrina Christofferson. I grew up in Virginia. Um, I came out to Utah to study veterinary science at Utah State, and I love it. Um, and thankfully, I got my lovely, lovely fiance to transfer there too. So now I don't have to drive two hours to go to BYUI and say hello every weekend. <laughs> yeah, it's so nice. Um, and. My family, I guess we grew up pretty orthodox LDS, as you could say. Um, I'm the baby of five. We love being outside. Um, we do a lot of stuff together. A lot of adventures. We love to travel. Mm -hmm. The two of us. Oh, yeah, true. I forgot to say that I yeah. also grew up LDS, um, the oldest of two brothers. And yeah. So, Carmina, um, let's start with your family. So we're not talking about typically and, and in a lot of Latter-day Stories episodes, we talk about Utah Mormonism, like where the how the church is and how the church um, operates in Utah. But for both of you, you uh, were both raised on the East Coast mm -hmm. in Maryland and Virginia, East Coast Coast ish. Um, so the church is a little different there. And typically, when it comes to topics like uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, things are a little uh, different mm -hmm. in, in typical Latter-day Saint households because the exposure level is much higher um, outside of Utah to this, this topic. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of start and better understand what your family life was like. Um, so, Carmen, we'll start maybe with you and just discuss, um, just tell us what family life was like growing up. Um, uh, how religious, uh, kind of what you were taught regarding this topic, and, and kind of give the listeners an idea as to what life was like in your household. Yeah, of course. Um, so 
Growing up, my dad was inactive. Um, he was in and out of the house. He was always working. So my dad wasn't really in the picture much of my life, but he is now. Um, and my mom took us to church like all the time. Um, uh, there were moments where I would cry because I didn't want to go to church and I didn't want to go to Sunday school and all that because I was the only girl out of all the boys in my um, my class. And so I didn't have friends. Uh, I just didn't really like going, but my mom made it like, made it a thing that we go to church because of God and not because of the people. And that stuck with me throughout my entire life. Um, and that's the reason why I, I'm trying to go to church again today. But uh, my parents, um, my mom was uh, like a very, like not like orthodox, but more like understanding. Like she wanted to become more like, like Christ instead of like following all the rules. So like less churchy and more gospely. Yes. Like she f loved the gospel, but understood that the church is separated from the gospel. And <clears throat> I, I also kept that um, close to my heart as well. Um, understood that going on the mission. And um, and yeah, uh, regarding the question of like LGBTQ, um, I knew when I was six and I thought I was normal uh, until my mom, one time in a restaurant, Golden Corral, she told me that um, that if any of my kids uh, come out to me as gay, I will kick them out of the house. And after that, I zipped my mouth, didn't say a word, um, kept myself in the closet for like a uh, couple years, maybe 10 or so. Uh, <laughs> Came out to a couple of my friends here and there and came out to my brothers too, but it took me a while to come out to my parents. Um, yeah, especially since they were uh, more churchy than, I don't know, other other people that I knew. And, yeah, and I, I want to, we'll circle back and jump into that because I think that's uh, super important um, that we kind of just unpack that because, I mean, there's a, there's a lot in that story. There, there's a lot especially, and I, I really want to hit uh, your your mom's um, position then and then how that has changed today and and where uh, where she's at today and and kind of how the the family kind of un un unpacked and unfolded this. And I also like the, the one part where you talked about separating the gospel of Jesus Christ from Mormonism. That's super important, especially um, in this space, because some of the some of the people that I find uh, that have the healthiest relationships post Mormonism or even nuanced Mormonism are those who can separate the gospel of Jesus Christ from the policy aspect of the church. And we'll talk, I'm sure, a lot about that today. So that's uh, yeah. So a thirty thousand foot view of uh, Carmina's life, Sabrina. So uh, growing up, um, I honestly. I feel like I led most of my life without any jarring experiences that made me think, oh, yep, I am, I love women more than the average person. <laughs> Cause I thought that just everyone like aesthetically thinks women are beautiful and would also like to kiss them. But like, I really had it ingrained that, oh, I can still love a man and go to the temple and you know, do that whole part of my life. Um, and I feel like growing up religiously, I really came to my own around 16 or so and really developed my relationship with God. Like everything was shaken down to a single taproot and that was God and that God, like prayer exists because he wants to communicate with me, because he loves me. And all facets of my testimony could be rooted to because he loves me. And I feel like that's really important as to where my testimony is now and why it is easier for me um, to kind of divide where, where do I know my testimony is? How do I deconstruct 
what people have taught me that God is or how he functions and how I know. And um, yeah, at least religiously, that's where I was. Um, and then growing up, I was taught that homosexuality was bad. I don't think it really dawned on me the scope of that. Um, for instance, when I was younger, I was, say, nine years old, and I had a friend who told me that they were transgender. Um, I guess they didn't use that word, but they said, I don't think I'm a girl. I think I'm a boy. And gleefully, <laughs> I was like, yeah, you can be a boy, and I can marry you. And the idea, the principle of being transgender was not a bad thing to me. Um, but had that same person at the same time, like that same year, I could tell you that I knew that being gay was bad because I told my friend, a different friend, that if I had a son or daughter who came out as gay, I would kick them out of my house. So you can see this disconnect where I was taught the vocabulary and that that was bad. But innately, the principle of things were not. Um, so, I mean, homosexual, not homosexuality. Um, homophobia is taught and transphobia is taught and I think that was something that was misunderstood in my family growing up. Good. I think, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for kind of explaining and I'm walking us through that. I think, um, Carmina, we start with you um, leading up through kind of your young adult years uh, and into high school. Yeah. Because Sabrina, in a very real sense, didn't really come out until much later. Yeah. You knew earlier um, kind of who and what you are. And with a mom who um, so boldly, boldly declared that she would want to kick her child out um, at that point if they ever come out. What was life like? How do you unpack that? Um, what what weight was put on your shoulders and how do you navigate that journey? Yeah, um, it was crazy. Like middle school, high school, I had crushes on girls, but I was like, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. And I remember uh, going to church and they would ask me, who's your crush at church? And I'm like, OK, wait, let me pick first. Uh, that person? No, that person. You know, it was just like, I can hide it. Let me I'll just hide it. I will won't tell anyone, I won't tell my parents until when I'm ready or when I'm brave enough or if I'm still here kind of thing. And um, I did develop some some anxiety and depression along the way uh, due to like some uh, parental um, issues, uh, family issues along the way in high school. It's really bad. Um, resolved now, but it was pretty bad growing up, and um, I did have um, suicidal uh, ideations, and um, still like still struggle a little bit um, from those. And um, but I just I kept the Lord on my side the entire time. It was uh, I told Him to please just take this away from me, like. You, you've heard that before. Um, please just take this away from me. I will do everything you want me to do. I'll go on a mission. I'll get married in a temple. I will find a man. I'll have children, whatever my patriarchal blessing says, you know. And um, I'll do it all for you because you're the only thing that's giving me peace at this point. A lot of Latter-day Saints, this is familiar. And for those mm -hmm. who aren't Latter-day Saints who aren't raised in this tradition. Um, even some Orthodox religions have kind of this this uh, promise. So I call it the grand bargain. This is the bargain that so many of us made with God. If you will just do X, Y, and Z, typically, uh, if you'll just take this away from me, if you'll remove this away from me, I will, and that's when the bargain comes in. And, and then we start laying down the parameters. Um, here's all the things that I know I struggle at or all the things that I know you probably want me to do, but I will do them if you take this away. So much pressure. Right, right. It was a lot of pressure, especially like as a teenager um, with school, you know, and everything going on. I had boyfriends that I 
were like, if only, if only I like do as much as I liked this other girl, you know? And <laughs> she says all the time, with almost every boyfriend that I had, I would count down the days until I got to break up with them. And I'm like, maybe that's normal with all relationships, you know? And Serena's like, no, <laughs> not that's not normal. <laughs> or all my other friends too, they would say, no, yeah, you know? But with Sabrina, it's way different. I am not counting the days. I am honestly counting the days until we get, I don't know, married. Married and like eternity or bust. Yeah. <laughs> just, I'm not thinking about it. I'm just thinking like I get to wake up every single day next to Sabrina. Like, I can't wait. You know? I love it. I, and, and I want to get to that point too where you meet because I, I know a lot of the audience is saying, we want the meat. We yeah. want the meat. <laughs> Um, it's a fun story, but I just, I need, I, I just feel like we need to talk a little bit about all of, all of the weight and the pressure that, um, not only just religion, but societal expectation puts on our shoulders. Um, I, I think I get it. I, I think the audience understands, um, really well, uh, what, uh, weights were put on our shoulders. So I want to reframe the questions a little bit by asking, where do you think, um, your life? And I don't want to say like, uh, what do you think would be different? But uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, resources or ways that people could have helped you in those times mm -hmm. that would have made life a little easier for you growing up, knowing all of these pressures, yet keeping so much of this closeted and hidden. I think I'm grateful that my young women's was very open. I feel like in general, we were pretty... Um, down to earth group and we didn't really focus on any of the superficial aspects of the church we very heavily focused on the meat of the gospel um and so i'm grateful that i was able to facilitate a lot of those discussions at the time um but i think one of the big things that helped me develop the confidence to explore my sexuality was finding someone, Carmina, who was in the church, who was open about her sexuality to me. And that's when I really was thinking, oh, I am really uncomfortable around men. I hate dating boys. Sorry, Kyle. <laughs> I'm sure you're quite the opposite. Oh, 100% no offense taken. <laughs> Um, and why do I not enjoy this thing that so many of my other peers enjoy? Like, why do I feel so nauseous at the thought of going on a date with a man? Um, and then suddenly I find someone who's open about it. And that was, I mean, truly life changing for me. But had I experienced something like that earlier in my youth, um, things would be a lot different for me. I know they would. So I guess being more open, it's hard to be in the church. Um, but I feel like sometimes we're getting closer to that or being more transparent about really what our beliefs are or what facets of our life are beyond the normal. Um, because so many people have such beautiful, colorful stories, and yet we're all kind of hiding behind this facade of perfection. It's a great way to put it. And I often kind of look at this um, in terms of bandwidth, like how much. So we're all familiar with the Internet and bandwidth and how if you if you have a lot of machines or a lot of devices that are connected to the Internet, it slows things down. So I often like look at this topic in, in terms of bandwidth, all the bandwidth that we lose by taking care of other people's interests and all of the expectations of our parents, of church, of society of our community, of God, of all of these interests who want our attention and want us to live or um, kind of put ourselves into a situation or a narrative that makes them feel comfortable and makes them feel like you're doing what they want you to do. When we lose um, all of that bandwidth, what left is there for us? Not much. <laughs> and that's kind of where listening to your story, Carmina, um, you had all of these people that were telling Carmina who Carmina was and inside you're screaming silently, this is who I am. 
And I just wonder, like, how, how do we change that? How do we fix that? How do we how do we make um, life better for all of the other Carminas and all the other Sabrinas and all the other Kyles out there who are screaming from the inside with no voices or sounds being heard? I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that there's definitely like when I was uh, like around 12 or whenever the, the site Mormon and Gay came out, um, I wish that site had like other resources like therapy or I wish it had like like other stories that didn't end up in like <laughs> not the way that I wanted it to like marrying the opposite sex but like other stories out there, you know, stories that I can actually relate to instead of like something that is like a cliffhanger or something that honestly just doesn't really help. And um, I, I don't know, just we just all need support. Uh, all the little Carminas and Sabrinas and Kyles just need support and find like um, a community, like a Oh, a, a way to find a community, you know? I, it took me a long time to f figure out where can I find all the other gay Mormons and where can I f find more gay people or those that are closeted and stuff like that. Um, I think that's an excellent observation, especially about Mormon and gay, uh, that website. Yeah. Because just two weeks ago, the church sent out another uh, invitation. They need more stories. They need more people to share their stories on uh, the church's uh, same-sex attracted. That's what more many gays turned into same-sex attracted dot org. Um, and I think your point is very, very, very important that those stories, the original dozen or so stories that were put on Mormon and gay are all gone. They're deleted because their soft focus scripted narratives didn't pan out. The people who were featured on those stories ended up getting married to people of their same gender. They ended up uh, creating joy and happiness in their dating experiences. They ended up falling in love and their lives did not fall apart. They still had spiritual experiences. They still were happy. They still had familial support. They still had ward support in many cases. And that scared the pants off of the church because the narrative was that as soon as you give in, um, and you fall and become one of those people on that side of the aisle, all of those things would, would go away. All the happiness, all the joy, all the spiritual experiences. And the stories that were featured on that site were contrary. And yeah. they were deleted. And now they're asking for more. And I think you're 100% right, and I love that you brought it up, because what you're asking for are stories that are unvarnished, that are honest, that are open, and that are willing to talk about the hard things, which is exactly why I have this podcast and it's exactly why um, I'm excited to have you two uh, sharing your stories as well, because they're candid, they're honest, they're real, and that's all I want, unscripted, and uh, we really just have an open conversation about our experiences, good, bad, and ugly. Yes. All the messy things. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and the juicy things, because I really want. <laughs> the juicy. I, I do want to get to the part where you meet. So um, w maybe we lead that into the. Uh, both of you talked a little bit about the grand bargain, um, making deals with God, and making deals with yourself. Saying I, I know something about me is different. I know something about me can be changed in a very real way because we are making these these bargains with God and with ourselves. So at some point, you both decide um, you want to serve missions. And whether that's part of the bargain or not, we, you can answer that. But you also are making these decisions around something called COVID, which also stirs uh, the whole trajectory of where each of you, your lives go. So um, Sabrina, let's first talk about preparing for a mission and what that was like for you. Who? Um, so I had just kind of assumed that I would go on a mission. Um, all my siblings had, and I have three sisters, which I feel like is kind of surprising that like all five of us went on missions. Um, and so it was just kind of like, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to do. 
um, or this is what I would like to do. My siblings enjoyed their missions and I love the idea of getting to go somewhere else and speak a new language and be around people. I'm such a people person. And this might be really awful, but I remember I really, really want to go to vet school. In fact, I just applied um, like two weeks ago. So if anyone is admissions out of vet school, please let me in. <laughs> um, but my advisor at the time said, missions look really good on your um, application. And that wasn't all the only reason why I wanted to go, but it was definitely a, a nice little kick in the butt to say, hey, Sabrina, like this is great. All around, it's great. Even though I was very, very um, perturbed that I couldn't go back to school for 18 months because I just wanted to get it over with. It's eight years. Let's finish this. Let's be, be done. Um, so I remember praying about it. It was March of 2019. And there wasn't anything that I particularly read. I remember reading my patriarchal blessing, blessing and Moroni 747, um, which talks about charity. And my big thing in religion is love. Funny, love. Um, and it was just, I felt so strongly that I needed to go now. And so two weeks later, I put in my papers and I got my mission call five days later, which is insane. Um, so I had the feeling that God was just waiting on me. He's like, come on, kid. We got things to do, people to see, and I have a plan, and you just have to get with the program. And so that was very exciting, getting my call five days later. Um, and then I left in August of 2019. And my mission, I don't know if anyone cares to know this, but I was originally called to Brisbane, Australia, and I was speaking Samoan. Um, so I got to the MTC, and of course I had to visa wait, and I prayed to God. I said, please send me anywhere but Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to know where I visa waited? I went to Colorado, but there's a little piece of Nebraska in there. And that's where I got to go. Um, <laughs> so my first day ever on my mission officially was in Nebraska. And it was amazing. Um, truly, just the experiences that you have on a mission are kind of unreal. Like, it just feels like a fever dream now looking back. I'm like, there's just no way that I met those people or you'd have these kinds of conversations. Um but I enjoyed Nebraska very much. And then I finally did get to go to Australia and I finally got to teach over there. And that was equally as enjoyable. Um, Australia is so fun and I wish I could go back. I actually got the impression. I said, you know, I want to come live here for school. So again, if anyone is in Brisbane, <laughs> <laughs> Queensland veterinary school, call me. Um, it's beautiful and the people there were so so lovely and um but i don't think i was my own at that point as a missionary if that makes any sense i think it will in a minute so then covid happens we get sent home it's april of 2020 and as many of the covid missionaries know you were given that kind of ultimatum april 30th um, of whether or not you were wanting to go back out and all of my missionary friends were immediately going back out. They had their um, their calls and they knew that where they were going and they're saying, yeah, Sabrina, I leave May 4th in like four days. And it was April 30th for me and I still didn't have my decision because I just felt so awful and I didn't want to go back out. My family didn't want me to go back out because they missed me so much. Being the baby, I think I might be one of the most entertaining of my family. And so what do you do when your source of entertainment is across the ocean? Nothing. Um, and so, and I felt like it was my, this is great. I can go back to school. I served my mission. I served faithfully. And this is my end. I can finish school. I can be done. And yeah, I still felt so nauseous about everything. And so I remember that day, it was rainy. I was in Washington, D.C., and I'm crying, and I'm just trying to find somewhere that I can pray. 
and talk to God. And of course, the temple is closed at the time, the Washington, D.C. temple. So I guess my brain thought the next best thing was the Lincoln Memorial um, because I found myself there and there was no one, not a soul on the steps, which is unheard of for the Lincoln Memorial. It was me and one security guard. And I'm sitting on the steps and I told God, I said, you know what, chief, if you need me to go, I'll go. And immediately I felt so much better. And I was like, dang it, <laughs> dang it. Now I have to go. And I said, but if you would like me to go, I would rather go in August. So that way I have my summer. I can do a summer semester. I can celebrate my birthday at home. It'll be great. Um, but if you need me to go, at this point, I've been so di directed by you that, like, I'll just do it. Because up until that point, I had so many experiences where I had tried for things. I tried to get into BYU. And I would pray. I said, hey, God, send me where I need to go. And it is the land of BYU. Their mascot's a cougar. Send me there. But send me where I need to go. And joke's on me. He And he said, make it as obvious as possible. And I didn't get into BYU against like all odds. And so that pushed me towards Utah State. And it was such an amazing shift that I feel like that really built my foundation of trust in God, that whatever path that he leads me to be on is going to be the best path for me. So throughout my entire mission process, I served three different places. Um, I still trusted that each of those places were going to be the most wonderful and effective places for me to be, um, which kinds of leads us into, um, meeting. We, I got my, Oh, I got my call. I remember the night before I sat down and I said, God, I'm going to buy my ticket to Utah. I'm going to sign up for classes and I'm going to apply to jobs tomorrow. And the next morning I got, I got my call to California, Santa Rosa, and I left in two weeks. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> I just can't do anything. So I was super grumpy when Carmina and I met in the airport in Houston on our way. Okay, we're not, we're, hold, let's, let's hold up for just a second because I know, so I just want to fill the audience in on a couple little things because uh, a lot of our audience, um, they're not Latter-day Saints. So um, when we talked about the MTC, that's the Missionary Training Center. And so when a missionary is called, especially a foreign mission, um, you are called, sent to the missionary training center. So for example, uh, Sabrina was called to Australia, which requires her to get a visa. Sometimes the church isn't able to obtain visas in time. So you become what they call a visa waiter. That means I'm waiting for my visa, but I'm already uh, called to serve my mission. So they send you somewhere. So in her case, they sent her to Colorado. And then uh, once your visa is approved, then you transfer out of Colorado to wherever you were serving, which is, uh, in her case, um, Australia. And then in the middle of all of that, COVID hits and pulls you out of beautiful Australia. So sad. Back to uh, Virginia and in the middle of COVID. So there was a lot going on. Um, that's really not uh, typical for missionaries to experience um, three different versions of a mission. Typically, Latter-day Saint missionaries will uh, receive their call, go into the MTC, the Missionary Training Center, and then fly out to the areas that they serve. And for sister missionaries, they serve um, for 18 months. And for um, male missionaries, elders, they serve for 24 months in, in that area. So before we get to the airport and before we get to California, um, Carmina, your yes. story. Because story. you also... Um, had to make that decision to serve a mission. And what was that experience like as you finally made your way to California as well? Right. Um, so when I was a kid, I would like dream of going on a mission. It wasn't like, oh, a new place. I, I just had like this fascination of like going somewhere and not being me or not being me, but like helping someone in need or something like that. Um, and so I looked up to all the missionaries that came by and everything, um, and I just wanted to be them so bad. And so I did everything. I, uh, got everything ready. Um, uh, when I was in 
Young Women's, which is like the the teenager um, women's group in church. It's like the class for them. Um, I made sure like every single girl in there wasn't alone because when I was a beehive, which is like the beginner, the group. beginner group of the young women's, um, I was alone. Not not a lot of people talked to me, <laughs> and so I made it a goal to talk to every literally every single person that comes in so they feel heard and feel you know safe being in a new new age in a new class group or whatever in church and so I had that mentality uh, going like signing all the papers to get my call um, and like ultimately I just wanted people to feel loved um, because I felt the love of Christ um, when I was going through really hard times um, with family and like myself hiding in the closet. Um, so that was my motive. I just wanted to serve God in that. And so I got my mission call to Londrina, uh, Brazil, when I was in college. Um, and it was crazy because most of my family served their missions in the Philippines. Again, my family is uh, Filipino and from the Philippines. And so I thought I was going to go there. And my cousin, his name is Daniel, he was like, if you get in, I'm going to start crying, like going to the Philippines. And then I opened up. It was Brazil. And I was like, no way. <laughs> no way. <laughs> like, I, I did not imagine myself going to South America or anything like that. But Man, I loved Brazil so much. I went to the MTC there, the Mission Training Center, uh, or the Citeame, and I, I loved the Brazilians. Like, it felt like I was one of them. <laughs> and the way I uh, would talk to them um, with my very little of knowing Portuguese. Um, I try to figure out ways to use my body language and like talk to them, uh, make fun of them <laughs> it, with the minimal words I had. And yeah, I just loved it so much. Um, and when they took that away from me, uh, I again, I went out in January of 2020 and I came back literally like two months later because of that, because of COVID. And I was like, gosh darn it, all the Brazilians were probably kissing each other, you know, we're very, it's very like intimate and very like everyone's family kind of thing, and which I love about it. And I was like, oh, you guys, come on. I love partying, but oh my gosh, this is the reason why I, I had to go back home. And, <laughs> and I was home for like those two months and I was thinking to myself, I'm like, man, I'm never coming out. I'm never going back out again. Like my, my chances of going to serve, like my dream, a mission is, is gone kind of thing. So I developed a depression again. Um, it just keeps happening over and over again. And then, um, I remember my stake president at the time, he, uh, he called me and told me that I was serving I got my call to Santa Rosa, California. And when I got the call, I was, I, I thought I was gonna be really excited, but because of that depression um, and anxiety, I was like, oh, yay, thank you, <laughs> kind of thing. Like, <laughs> like hesitant, I'm like, I thought, I thought I was, I thought this was the end. I thought, you know, a lot of things were, I don't know, kind of thing. And, and because of Brazil, I had a lot of crushes on women and I'm like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I, <laughs> this is really hard for me. And maybe I won't go back out to save myself from having a, another crush on a straight woman kind of thing. Um, have all been there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I said, yes. And I packed my bags. I was very really scared at this point because I, I don't know why but I had a feeling that this mission in California was going to change my life like for the rest of my life yeah um crazy 
meeting Sabrina <laughs> and then also like dealing with mental health and uh, learning how to love myself too. That was most of, yeah. So we can get into that when you when it come in time. I don't oh, know. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. We, we're into it. Yes, so, perfect. I, I, so it's the airport now. You both have been called to the same missions. Uh, you're both, v, uh, you, you both were transferred out of your original areas that you were serving in. And I don't want to say completely begrudgingly, but you both, um, kind of <laughs> were stuck in California <laughs> yep. in the middle of COVID with a lot of things going on. Yeah. That was one thing that I was not excited for was the idea that I'm going to have to do all this work online and I'm never going to leave my house. I'm not going to see people. But the beauty of Northern California is that they were so lenient, like much more lenient about um, things. And so it felt more like a normal mission than I think a lot of people got. But we're getting too far. The airport. The airport. So I am FaceTiming my sister because I know it's going to be one of the last times I'll get to do so. And I'm complaining to her. I'm like, Sydney if any one of these missionaries looks at me and says, Sister Christofferson, are you so excited to be serving in California? I think I'll lose my mind. <laughs> and lo and behold, I see them, all their name tags and the aura that they give off. And I'm like, I got to go. And they immediately say, Sister Christofferson, are you so excited to be serving in California? And I'm like, mm hmm, so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so excited to be pushed out of all my normal habits and everything to be back here. Um, and as we're introducing each other, um, Carmina here says, I'm Sister Login and I'm from Maryland. And immediately, I'm sure you guys understand. She felt like home. It felt like I'm not around all these Utah missionaries. I'm around someone who's who understands me better and who I feel like I've known forever. I don't know if you felt that way. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I thought you were really already my friend. Yeah, BFFs. BFFs. And um, we had a few days where they did trainings for us to help us understand the general functioning of this mission in particular. And so the chemistry was insane. We'd be making fun of each other um, at like our lunches. And here I'm thinking, this girl's funny. And like, you don't just become best friends with someone after a day. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm I, speechless. <laughs> no, yeah, because I... When I got her aura, I like literally can feel the vibes, right? I can feel her vibe and say like, I've known you like before this life. And I don't know, I feel like we're meant to be best friends or like stick together. And you got gay vibes from me, apparently. I also, I also got gay vibes from her cause I can, I can, I can pick it out out of all the missionaries. There are very few, but Sabrina was like screaming for some reason. And I was like, I'm not going to say anything until we come home. So uh, until we got home, we were very far apart on our missions, um, like maybe three or four hours, I think, just on total opposite ends. And the only way that we could communicate as missionaries of the same mission, and this isn't for all missions, this was just ours, the rule was that you had to write letters to each other. And so in the most sapphic fashion, Carmina and I started writing letters and like long letters, six page letters. And I'm not one to write like that. Me neither. <laughs> ever. And so I looked forward to those like they were, I don't know, sent from God. I don't know if that's like <laughs> sacrilegious <laughs> to say, but like Christmas. Yeah, it was like Christmas getting to see your handwritten letter in the mail <laughs> and it was all platonic too like yeah. it was like questions like what is your order from chick-fil-a or something like that have that memorized right now yeah, yeah. or what do you eat when you're sad and hers is chipotle the steak burrito bowls so <laughs> 
um, super platonic. And we would always say, oh, we should be companions one day. And that never happened because she went home in September. And so my dreams were crushed. Like I would never see this girl again. But then we got to when I went home, we kept saying, we need to hang out. We need to hang out. And we did finally. Yeah, we met in the middle since she's in Virginia and I'm from Maryland. We met up in Washington, D.C. And we, I don't know, we hung out for 12 hours that day. Like, I didn't expect this. I was like, maybe this is going to be like a lunch and then we, I go back home kind of thing. No, this was 12 hours of us. I don't know. We, it was literally just us talking. And what was weird, too, was when she picked me up, I was with my mom um, and it felt like I was introducing Carmina as a partner, like, yeah, as yeah. a partner. And it was like, oh, you're meeting my parents for the first time. So weird. <laughs> but I'm like, that's odd. She's just my friend. <laughs> um, and so during this 12 hour date, at some point we're lying on the floor and she tells me, you know, I should probably tell you that I'm bi. And I look at her dead in the eyes and I say, amazing. I'm so happy for you. I'm super straight, but power to you, ally. And she looks at me and says, oh, uh, I said, <laughs> you're not really my type. Which which is like bull crap because, again, my first crush was Kristen Dunst from Spider-Man at Ginger. I'm a ginger. <laughs> Spring is a ginger. <laughs> and so... Um, I, I looked at her and in my mind, I'm like, I'm adorable, like, come on. And so I think I love the chase. <laughs> and so in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to make you fall in love with me. Cause I know it can happen. I can make anyone fall in love with me. Like what? <laughs> and so she's like, oh, I know you're not straight. I know you're not. I got the gay vibes. And so we are both on a, on a trip to make each other fall in love with each other so win-win win-win and it um the only thing better is if it were on the steps of the lincoln memorial which i'm guessing it was not it was not no, no it was an abandoned dance hall above a boba shop so not as romantic <laughs> yeah you could have had your full circle moment there like i started i started my california mission my trip my like final uh leg of my mission um making my bargain with God on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, but he chose a boba shop. Yeah, boba shop. Boba shop. It's good. Everyone go to a boba shop. Get you get get you some good boba and then find a partner while you're doing it. Yeah. Let's talk about that find a partner thing because I mean clearly it's it's fun because you both are awkwardly kind of navigating a space that you'd never navigated before. Yeah. Uh, neither of you had gay dated. Um, so neither of you had uh, kind of pursued or kind of walked uh, this type of a relationship before. Both of you seem like, though, that you wanted to give each other um, a run for their money and, <laughs> yeah. and, and make it worth it, the, the, the chase, the catch. Mm -hmm. um, so what was um, dating like and how do you begin to date coming from the background that we've talked about for the last 45 minutes or so? It was so scary, so hard. But I mean, the nice thing was, was that I was doing it with her. And so it just felt so natural. Like, um, we had this very stupid plan because I was going back to school in April. And so she said, I'll drive all the way down to your house. We'll stay a few days. And I said, awesome. We'll drive back side by side and I'll stay a few days at your house. And so we did that. <laughs> Um, which is a four hour drive one way, mind you. And when we were up at her house, I think that's when you said you fell in love with me. I did. I fell hard. I had like this really big crush on her and we were just longboarding. We we're hanging out, showing her like every, everything about my hometown. And, um, yeah, I was like, shoot, I have a crush on a straight girl again. And I found it so hard to leave her house. I begged her mom. I felt like a kid again with Carmina. I still do. Like I was getting grass stains on my pants because I was having the best time with her. Or um, I begged her mom to let me stay another day. 
like I would beg my mom, hey, you can just another hour on this play date. Like I'm an adult and yet here I am. I'm like, I cannot be away from you. And when I did move out to Utah, I was so sad. And Carmina said, hey, well, I have a cousin who's getting married out there, so I'll just come meet you. And I would do anything, literally anything. So I picked her up after the wedding and she's at Temple Square. And the tension in my car <laughs> was insane because up until that point, we are FaceTiming all the time. We're Snapchatting. We are flirting with each other hardcore. And I think it was one of those things where I'm a little bit worried that I'm taking it a little too far, <laughs> but I was not going to stand down. No, I'm going to, I'm going to go all the way and see where it happens, see where it goes. Yeah. So picking you up in the car. Right. Um, again, a lot of tension. I was like, I want to hold her hand so bad. I just want to, I don't know. Um, again, flirting. And we drive up to this canyon again in Sabrina's letter. When I was on the, when we were all both on the mission, she said her perfect date, it was to like get fast food and then go up the Canyon. And guess what? We went up the Canyon after we ate and I was like, Oh my gosh, I think she likes me too. Kind of thing. You won. You, you finally made her day. I <laughs> <laughs> you won't straight to fight at her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. And I was like, yeah, she likes me too. I, I can definitely feel it with all these vibes and we're up little cottonwood canyon in logan uh, not logan um sandy sandy area. yeah and we're just talking and we're cuddling too and i'm not the type to cuddle but here i am cuddling sabrina and i'm like wow this is amazing and uh she says hey i have to tell you something and it took her 20 minutes for her to say this she was just stalling and not saying anything but. Like she's like staring at me and I'm just silent looking at all the cars thinking, don't say this, don't say this, but you have to say this. You can't be alone when you tell her that you want to kiss her so bad. You can't sit by that on your own. And yeah. I did tell her that and I sang it to her because that's how I cope when I'm nervous. I sing. Sing it. I want to make out with you so bad. That's how it was. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, same. And I'm no, you can't because we're missionaries or return missionaries and members of the church. You can't do that. And I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. Whatever. Heartbroken. But I took her home and she kissed me through the window of my car when I dropped her off. So another win. Another win. <laughs> For team carb. <laughs> um, <laughs> carb. Carb. And... What was that? That's in April. So we talked a lot during May. Um, actually, I asked for space because I was worried. Because on my side, I'm thinking, here I am with this can of worms that I have no experience with. I, as far as I've been told, have been, gay people are bad with the church. You cannot live both those lives together. And so it's either I choose one where God has been loving me and I've been trusting him my whole life and it's taken me all these wonderful places and I've gotten to do all these wonderful things and I felt so good or I explore this relationship where I finally feel so good and so loved and heard and I feel safe um because for the first time like I've said previously I'd go on these dates with boys and I'd be so grossly unimpressed and so averse to any second dates and the expectations that came along with those, the idea of kissing a boy was just so... Ew, David. Ew, David. And suddenly, at this girl, I'm, I'm making the first move. That would never have happened. Um, and so that was really scary to think, do I choose one or the other? How do I navigate this? Am I eventually going to have to leave? And if I do pray about her and pray about, like, if she's kind of the one for me... And God says no, because I fully expected him to say no. I either deny that and deny what I know and love and still date her, or he says no, and I have to deny the person that makes me feel so alive 
and so loved. And I just don't believe that a loving God, who I know is loving, who I know personally, would ever ask me to make that decision. So that was really confusing for me, and that's why it took a long time. The real slow burn here. Very. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so while we're both spiraling, we're like, <laughs> oh my gosh, what are we going to do next? Like, what are we going to do? And Sabrina was like, hey, I need space. So that was the first friend zone. <laughs> I, and um, I was like, okay, cool. We can just be friends. And Sabrina's like, hey, Ashley, you want to come to Hawaii with me, with my sister? Even though we're, we have, we're doing space right now, we can, we can both go to Hawaii and like have so much fun together, but just no kissing kind of thing. Uh, surprise, surprise. There were a lot of kissing on that trip. Yeah. <laughs> we, we had the best time. And when we went home, I dropped her off at the airport and saying goodbye again. We're both like crying, which just, I don't know, isn't normal for me or I don't think very normal for you either. Yeah. And I was like, I, I think I love this girl. Um, but I hosted a party in July, anything to get her to come out because she's still in Maryland and I'm still in Utah. So I hosted this 21 birthday bash and I told her, I said, I'll pay for your ticket, come out here for a week. And so she did. And I'm a simp. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so fun. But there was one point where the first time I'd ever seen her cry was when we were talking about what are we? Um, cause she's like, you know, we're dating, right? Basically long distance. And I said, yeah, but I don't know what sexuality I am. And I don't know if I'm ready to come out. Like, I feel like I have to be solidified in whatever decision I make in order to come out to my family. Um, cause I don't want to backtrack a whole bunch or say, no, this isn't like, this is good for me. This is who I am. And so I said, I need more time. I I'm scared of labels right now, um, and I just don't know what to do. Like this sucks, and that was that was a really tender moment with us, mm -hmm. saying like we're we're gonna figure this out. Like we're both gonna go talk to God. We're both gonna uh, have this good communication. Like we're gonna talk about this every single day. Um, see where we're at. If we need space, we need space kind of thing. Very understanding and patient. And uh, August comes around and I asked her to come out to Maryland uh, to see like my family reunion and see how it goes because Filipino family reunions are super fun. I got to meet the whole family, guys. <laughs> my yeah. first trip. Yeah, she, she met the whole family and... There was a moment when we were both on the beach and um, I, Sabrina was very nervous and very like, I don't know, you were- I was crying. You were crying. About my she, future she and how it, it feels so crumbly. Crumbly. And I told her that no matter what, I will support you and I will follow you wherever you go in life, no matter if you don't want me if you do want me I will support you and I will love you until the ends of the earth kind of thing it was very poetic and I don't know <laughs> romantic and kind of kind of thing and she was crying and I was like I was starting to tear up and I asked her to be my girlfriend and I said yes so August 21st 2021 boom and we had both prayed about it at that point though yeah we both um before she came out, I was fasting, uh, which is like sacrificing a meal or or two, um, or fa sacrificing anything in order to um, humble yourself to the Lord. And I, I asked what I should be doing, and the answer he gave me was crazy because while it, he was telling me it in paragraphs. And while he's telling me in paragraphs, I was typing it on my phone, so I can always remember it. I have a very bad memory. But um, I do remember that, <laughs> that he told me that this is in my plan. 
I need you to live in harmony with Sabrina and care for her. She is there for you to teach other people how to love each other and how to love others just like you. And that was basically the sum of it. But um, I was just like astounded. I was mind blown that he would say yes. You know, again, I was looking for a neutral answer. I was like, tell me now, tell me now if I need to break things off if this will be better for me and because I I love our relationship God and I I don't want to like waste it or anything so please just tell me what I need to do kind of thing I asked and I received so he told me go for it this is this is a good thing yeah I love the story <laughs> it's pretty cinematic right it's it's wonderful and it's like I I I wish all lesbian, bisexual, gay kids had the opportunity to just be free, um, who who have this intersection, who are closeted, who are navigating, who who question, who wonder, who who say to themselves, um, if I just had an opportunity to be able to be who and what I am, um, could I have this too? Beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. We quite like it. <laughs> Uh, I just can't help but think, though, um, you, Sabrina, said, I still have to tell my family. Like, I have to come out. And um, you, you still were on the outside playing straight Sabrina. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was, I didn't tell them for, well, I didn't tell my parents for about four months. So that was quite the coming out was hi I met someone who I love and like congratulations and clapping and then I said oh it's Carmina and silence <laughs> which I realized coming out and then telling your parents that you also have been dating someone for four months in secret is cause for silence um but that was that was difficult um the interesting thing though is when I did start coming out I came out to my sister first the day after I got back um, from that trip and I said, God said yes. And Carmina and I are dating. And she said, well, are you like, what do you identify as? And I said, 99% straight and 1% lesbian. And I feel like now it's the absolute reverse. <laughs> reverse. <laughs> Funny how that happens. Sexuality is fluid or I was in denial. Um, and I'm like, Carmina's just that 1%. But when I started telling people, especially my friends who have known me for a long time in and out of the church, the support was unreal. I was imagining pitchforks and fire. Um, and especially my friends in the church who had served missions were so, so wonderful to talk to um, and so supportive. I feel like you had that, right? Yeah. 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 Um, and so it took me a few weeks of encouragement to be able to tell my parents and some hard things. I remember telling my bishop at the time, um, oh, I'm dating this girl. I, it was the same thing. I'm dating someone. And he said, that's awesome. And then I was starting to cry and I turned my phone around and I showed him the screensaver and it was me and Carmina and his face dropped. And, and he said, I'm so sorry. And that was the first time I had ever had someone who wasn't supportive of our relationship. Um, and that was so hard. And I had only come there to ask him what I should do about asking my parents. I only came for some semblance of an older person, how I should approach that with people who are so in the church um, as my parents and having a response like that was pretty heartbreaking. Um, but I ended up telling them and it's been rocky. They're coming around. I've had a lot of conversations with my parents. Now, Carmina, we started the episode with you talking about how your mom said if any of her kids ever came out, uh, she would kick him out of the house. We're now talking about a relationship. So yeah. Uh, how did your mom take the news? How did your family take the news? And how did you 
break the news to them. Right. Um, so I didn't come out like, this is my girlfriend and I'm gay kind of thing. I was 19. It was before my mission. And um, my mom had some suspicions. We're both, we both had the vibe thing. She had some suspicions that I was really like hard on myself and I, there was something going on. And so she sat me down when I came home from college um, and she was like, so what's going on? And I'm like, mom, I, I think I'm bi or I think I'm gay, either one, you know? Um, and that was a four hour conversation with my mom. It was uh, neutral, I would say. I think, and then it was like 30 minutes of my dad coming in and then he went out. <laughs> my dad. <laughs> love him but um yeah it was four hours and my mom was I think worried for me she was like I want my daughter to be happy and I want her to be treated nicely to by other people and again with news and homophobia everywhere especially in the church too um she just wanted me to be supported and and loved you know um so she had some worries about that. And then when I came out to her about Sabrina, um, I told her like maybe a month in. <laughs> I just couldn't, I couldn't keep it off my chest. I was like, me and my mom are pretty tight and we talk a lot. And I was like, mom, I'm dating someone. And she's like, uh-huh, <laughs> kind of thing. And I'm like, it's Sabrina. And then she was like, how did I know that <laughs> kind of thing? And I'm like, mom, no, <laughs> how did you know that? She's like, well, you guys are really close and everything. And so it took her a while for her to like get adjusted to it. Um, I guess a few months after I told her that she told me her true feelings about my relationship, which was really hard. Cause again, me and my mom are pretty tight and we didn't talk for like two weeks because of that. Um, and my mom told me that she was, she's embarrassed and humiliated that people would find out at the church knowing, and, and my family in the Philippines too, um, that I'm in a relationship with, with a woman and she feels like her status at church is not like other people again she was pressured by a lot of church members and all that and um i think she come come to figure out come to terms that it doesn't matter what other people think it matters what god thinks and um it took her a while to get there but ultimately she just loves sabrina and again we uh we spent a summer uh, in Maryland at my house and Sabrina was living there too. And my parents just love Sabrina, like with all their hearts. And I don't know, I just was really lucky when it came to that. Um, my dad on the other hand had a lot of arguments with him, but <laughs> he came around, he's uh, supporting and he even buys rainbow things sometimes for my dog. and. He's like, look, Carmina, Blue is a, my dog, Blue, um, he supports you too, kind of thing. And I'm like, mm, it's the little things. It's, it's, it's yeah. the little things. And I'm like, thanks, Dad. <laughs> so, yeah, it took a while, but yeah. And I'm glad you brought up the church because I, one aspect of the interview that I'll, I want to really get to and talk about as well is the other missionaries and your mission president who knows um, you two serve together. Has there been any discussion with other missionaries um, and your mission president, uh, knowing that it was the mission that brought you two together? You know, I was very nervous telling my companions. I think that was difficult because I'm like, oh, will they feel weird that they were like with this closeted lesbian <laughs> serving with them? But they were also that's my internalized homophobia speaking by the way <laughs> that's what i'm still struggling to uh shake off like we all do um but they have 
They've been so lovely. Um, I mean, there's like some broadband people who like I don't really know much about. Um, they aren't as like into gay people, I guess, <laughs> or as supportive. But thankfully, I don't really associate with those people anyways. And I don't know. I'm sure they know our mission president and his wife. Probably. They probably know. I don't think I have told them. So, hello, President Puffer. (laughs) Surprise. Sister Puffer, hello. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but we're actually going to a mission reunion after this, So, and it's that mission reunion, so we're very excited. A lot of the um, senior missionaries who are just retired adults who decided to serve missions together as a couple, which I'm very jealous. I want to do that someday. Um, They sent us a text and they said, oh, congratulations on your engagement. Like you two come together. So I feel like there's this sense of please come and just be about it. But who knows? I, I was super interested because I definitely want to know how, how it works out because yeah. um, with a lot of a lot of missionaries, even from my own mission who have come out, um, there's, there's like this hesitancy uh, to avoid the kind of that old life and to avoid mm-hmm. mission um, experiences and mission stories and mission friends and mm-hmm. mission companions for fear of not knowing what those companions will think. Um, there was even a time when I thought about it, I'm like, you know, maybe I should do like an ex-Mormon missionary reunion. Those who, have, <laughs> those who have left the church, like do a little bit of a mission reunion for those who have left the church. We didn't have, we wouldn't have to do it in a, um, in a church house. We wouldn't have to start with a prayer. We wouldn't have to have green jello and carrots and funeral potatoes and all the things <laughs> that, um, that are stereotypical Mormon. Because the, really the important part of those mission reunions, in my opinion, was just saying hello to the, your old friends yeah. and being together again and being back in kind of that atmosphere because missions aren't easy. Um, missions are also fun and they're, they're, they're challenging and they're exciting and they're all the emotions. And you did it with people who are kind of navigating that world at the same time as you. So that aspect of the mission reunion, I, I think, can be super beneficial and fun. The one where you have to say, hey, I've left the church, or hey, I'm in a relationship, or hey, things are different, um, those become difficult. Those are mission reunions that become somewhat awkward. So I am I am curious to see how yours will turn out. Strangely enough, our mission has um, produced a lot of <laughs> missionaries or return missionaries that are part of the LGBTQ plus community. We're not even the only lesbian couple from like our core ho- cohort that came out of that mission so yeah it's crazy (laughs) yeah so i guess that's kind of nice that we're not the only gay couple oh i'm fully convinced the the church doesn't realize the the length and breadth um and how this topic impacts mormonism it's deep its roots run very very deep and um there was just a statistic that was put out a study that was just uh released uh two or three weeks ago that uh, one in five, uh, 20% of uh, students that attend church schools, uh, so college-age Mormons, identify uh, not as straight, so LGBTQ. Me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and think about that, like one, two, three, four, you, one, two, three, four, you, one, two, three, four, you, when you're looking at a, a group of uh, college-age Latter-day Saints. Yeah. That's a lot. That is a lot. Even... Even at Utah State, it's not a college school, but... Church school. It, yeah, it, or, <laughs> college church school. It is a college. Um, they People crawl out of the woodwork once they find out that you're gay. And then once they started telling people, oh, yeah, like this is my girlfriend and showing pictures, then they'd say, oh, yeah, I have a girlfriend or I'm bi. And suddenly this group that I felt like was only me is now so much larger and you start to notice all these people and be more welcoming and then see how vast the community really is. That's a great point. Even in Utah, which is a very not, it's a very sheltered group of people, I feel like. There's still a very large community. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about community too because you both have a TikTok. Yes. And you are all over TikTok um, spreading the good word and uh, converting people to the gospel of gayness. 
<laughs> yep. Tell us a little bit about it. Tell us uh, your TikTok handle and uh, what do you experience? What do you share? What do you um, what do you put into this social media uh, sphere and what do you get back out of it? Right. Um, so I guess m most of the content is on my um, my TikTok account. account. Hashtag Enong or something like that. Enong is Enong. Yeah, Enong is my uh, it's my nickname from my family. So uh, yeah, I I just love like making silly videos, and it was just me and Sabrina. And at the time I was at BYUI, I made a TikTok saying like me and Sabrina hiding from everyone to get cheap tuition or something like that. And there were a whole bunch, like, it was started blowing up. Um, and a lot of the comments were like, hey, I think you should take this down before someone starts reporting you to the honor code or starts reporting you to the, the head of the school kind of thing. And I was really worried because I've already been reported to the honor code at BYUI because of my relationship with Sabrina. And so I was like, if I get another report, I could get kicked out of the school or get a, a record on my name that won't tell other grad schools what I did kind of thing. She could be a rapist or she could be gay. Who knows? Who knows? You know, which is... Because those are two very equivalent things, right? <laughs> yeah. That's insane. And the point is, like, that, that is how the, the church, church schools use it. Uh, view this topic. Yep. And so they will annotate your record and send you off with your transcript and into the low and lone and dreary world uh, to fend for yourself. Right. And again, I was really scared at the time. I wanted to, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to transfer. Oh my gosh, I got to, because I'm blowing up on TikTok. <laughs> and um, so I took it down. Um, I think it's back up again since I just transferred to USU. She's um, safe. I am safe. It's a, oh my gosh, a relief. But, um, and then I just kept being incognito about my relationship with Sabrina on my like Instagram and my TikTok. And there was a question about, or there was a, a TikTok, um, th that said, um, it was uh, oh, show uh, us a picture of like your first picture with your person and then your most recent one. Right. And our first picture together was us with our missionary name tags and the other one was us and we're engaged yes so and that blew up and kind of sparked some questions about our story so we made one about our story mm -hmm. and then that that was the main one that blew up um big time big time and there's a lot of people asking oh let me do your photography oh let's do these podcasts so thank you for asking us to be here um and uh a lot of people were asking so many questions about how do you do it? Or well, what are your parents, how do your parents feel about this? Or what are your stances of the church? Do you still go to the temple? Again, so many questions. So we started answering them video by video. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be more creative, start. Uh, I made a shorter one for those that have ADHD like me. Um, because pictures. <laughs> with pictures and videos, because the our story, the one that blew up, is just us talking, and I sometimes can lose track because <laughs> I'm like, uh, better they keep talking, and it's me who's talking. Oh my gosh, I'm so annoying. <laughs> but um, yeah, um, yeah, we kept keep making more videos about um, mm -hmm. our lives as um, gay Latter-day Saints, and here we are. Spell the. Um Spell the TikTok for those who are listening and watching um, so they can find your content. Um, it's, so you spell out hashtag H-A-S-H-T-A-G, <laughs> hashtag, <laughs> and then without a space, Enung, I-N-A-N-G. N-G, sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hashtag I-N-A-N-G. Yep. <laughs> Oh boy, <laughs> gotta go back to school. We got it. I, yeah. I just want I want 
the listeners and the viewers of uh, this episode to be able to connect with your TikTok as well, because mm -hmm. I've loved it. I, I really have just enjoyed seeing, you know, we earlier in the episode, we talked about um, just the lack of candid, honest, um, open discussions about this topic. That's what you're providing. You're providing content that shows um, just the raw, vulnerable, candid experiences that, that you two are having as you navigate something super unfamiliar, super foreign, but something that feels so correct and honest and and loving and joyful and and i and i know that the people who are watching this episode those who at least see it from uh the video version can see the the way love radiates uh between you two and see the way that uh, you are connected so thank you for at least uh, from my pew uh putting that content out there so people can uh benefit from it because it means a lot it means a lot to me thank, thank you, you. That's, yeah, that's really nice to hear. I think uh, most of the part too, I just didn't want people to feel alone if they were in my my spot. Again, that was my like motto since I was a beehive, so 12 or 11. I, I don't know what age it was, but I just didn't want people like me to be alone because I was at that point and it created some um some really harsh uh Traumatic realities. realities, traumatic realities, and mental illness that I still deal with today. Um, yeah, I just want them to have a virtual hug at least, you know? I really like it. As we wrap the podcast, um, I'm curious what you wanted the audience to know, um, what, what your message um, in this episode should be, and what we didn't talk about that you wanted to talk about. Um, I feel like a hippie when I say this, but love is what makes the world go round. And that in God's true church, there is no room for hate. Um, take that as you will. <laughs> um, that he loves whatever you love. And that wherever your heart takes you, you were made for a reason that way. I was made to... Um, be incredibly averse to the idea of male attraction to myself. And I was made to love Carmina. And so allowing myself to do that and to trust God and the way that he has created me and led my life so far. I mean, the way we met was not a coincidence at all. I am never one to believe in coincidences. No way. Um, so I feel like that was just simply divine and to trust wherever he puts you, um, or trust wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Spirituality is as fluid as sexuality and as fluid as water. It's not something that you have to be so strict on. And if you don't figure it out right now, girl, none of us have it figured out. So that's okay. Join the club. <laughs> <'Cause Yeah. laughs> Even though we might spit out that we feel, you know, one way or another, it's a day-to-day -day thing, the way that we feel about our spirituality, and that's okay. I don't think any creator of yours would expect you to know it all right now. Yeah, because he's, he's your father. He's your God. He, he created you, and he loves you. Uh, same thing. Um, everything he, she said, basically, but... I would want to everyone, again, little Carminas, little Sabrinas, and little Kyles, that you're not alone. Um, we've been through it, we're still going through it, and we're here for you, you know? I, all the virtual hugs I will give to literally everyone who is struggling out there, and, um, and that God loves you, no matter who you are, what you are, and what you identify, where you came from, he loves you regardless. It's unconditional and never doubt that. If that is the only thing that keeps you on this earth today, keep it and hold it for dear life because sometimes that's what I had to do at some points, you know. Um, but yeah, other than um, we're here for you, uh, Take care of yourself. Drink lots of water. 
<laughs> yeah. take, take care of yourself. Take care of your mental health, if you're, especially for those that are struggling with it. I know that I am and Sabrina too. Um, if you need to take a day, take that day. Take a mental health day. I've done it multiple times. I told Sabrina <laughs> multiple times when we were talking um, that, hey, I, I'm not going to be on my phone for a while. And she would like message me the entire day like oh so I'm doing this this but take that day relax your brain take care of yourself and um you don't need to have it figured out anytime yeah, soon you don't um yeah make sure you I don't know just just love just love love is love love is love <laughs> is love is love is love is love thank you uh, you two have a beautiful story uh, you have a, an exciting life ahead, which I'm super excited to watch unfold. Um, you're engaged to be married, so that will be happening soon. Um, I definitely want an invitation. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Hello, we need to be there. Um, I'll bring my name tag with me just in, <laughs> in, in to show my uh, support and solidarity for the, the tag. But I, it's just been a fascinating episode. It's been exciting to be able to uh, get to know and, and understand your story a little better, to be able to be raw and vulnerable and, and just candid um, on a topic that for many people, this isn't easy to talk about, but so necessary to, just as you say, um, the three ring mission of this, uh, of the Latter Gay Stories podcast has always been to help people know that you're not alone, that you're not broken and that your best days are ahead. If I could help share that message again and again and again and again, I will. And I, and I continue to do that because there are other people out there who are just like you. And there are other people out there who are having spiritual experiences and joy and navigating this journey one step at a, at a time. And you two are evidence of that. And so um, thank you for being another example and another witness of what happens when two people fall in love, madly in love. <laughs> madly. Madly. Thank you again. Um, thank you for sharing your stories and, and uh, for joining the podcast. And I look forward to the future. Us too. Us it's too. It's going to be the best days ahead. Yes. Thank you, Kyle, for inviting us here. For those of you who are following along on the video and audio version, we invite you to subscribe uh, wherever you're listening or watching. And also, if you are uh, participating in a video version, we'd love to hear your thoughts about this particular episode. And please share it. Uh, if you think this message and this story uh, relates or should be um, shared to an audience somewhere, please do it. Uh, please share it to an individual. Please share it uh, wherever you think uh, the message can be loved and can be embraced because that's how uh, we continue to build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ communities. But more importantly, that's just how we better understand the LGBTQ experience is by listening to stories like Sabrina and Carmina's. Again, I thank them for spending a little time. Thank you for giving us a little bit more than an hour this time uh, to better understand their, ex uh, their story and their experience. But it was well worth it, and I'm super excited to be able to share it. It's stories like Carmina's, it's stories like Sabrina's, it's stories like yours that help us each continue writing our own latter gay story. <laughs>